Today I'm here with Marty Waldman, who is the co-founder of Space Information Labs and Endeavor Institute. And today he brought some pretty awesome stuff that I wanted him to share with his experiences, his, his, his uh, stories involving space and all the opportunities that are out there. So, hey, thanks for just coming here today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what all this stuff's about. Yeah, thanks, Nick. It's, it's quite a journey. Life's a journey. And uh, I can go off on small details, but I'll try to keep on the overview. The main thing is the journey. The fantastic people I've met along the way, the synergies that have formed because of that, the things that we've accomplished. And you know, even though I'm like gonna be 64, I feel like I'm still like in 10th grade or something. It's like, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the future. Like, it's still so much is happening. And also this is like the golden age, I always say this, the golden age of aerospace entrepreneurship. There's so much going on now. Well, let's talk about how you became a space entrepreneur. Like, what got you to where you are today? Okay, so I wasn't always a space entrepreneur, but in my mind I was ever since as a little boy. <laughs> um, I have this great photo, and I should have brought it. This great photo at home that my father took me on a bicycle in uh, April of 1961. And little did I know, I didn't even realize at the time, but that's when uh, Yuri Gagarin first launched into space, April 12th, 61. So here's like little Marty right there. And it could have even been taken on that day. I don't know. It just says April 61 on the photo. And it's like, that was like, that was my mission. It's so interesting. I came across that photo with that date. It kind of astounded me. So... But right around that time, I was like seven at the time, um, the first steps of the United States going out into space were happening, and Soviet Union. And this got my attention. I was very interested in this concept. It was like, wow. And there was a lot of interest in the world at that time. But yeah, I have a lot of friends from high school. That say, like, I was like the space nut. <laughs> it's like other people were interested, but I was really into this for whatever reason. This became the, the foundation, the seeds for my life. So from that point, like I, I remember uh, probably like it was 1960 or something like that. I'd, I'd set my uh, alarm clock to, to wake me up when the first, uh, it was called Ranger probes that were launching. They were first hitting the moon. And I wanted to like be awake when we were first like touching the moon. So again, it's like very interesting stuff to me. And then I was like perfect age for the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo missions. Uh, very much got my attention, especially Apollo. I was in high school at the time. And it's like I wanted to meet the astronauts. I wanted to do like all this stuff. But at the same time, I'm this high school student. And I had a whole life of, quote, education ahead of me so I could even get to that point. So back then, like, you know, 1969, Neil Armstrong, so I rode away to NASA, and he sent me this nice little picture back saying to Marty Waldman, best wishes, Neil Armstrong. Some of the folks out there might even have some. I don't know. So uh, this was uh, very important, and uh, then I eventually I collected all of their autographs. Years later, <laughs> with the uh, beard starting to turn a little gray, I actually got to meet him, and uh, this was... Uh, at Edwards Air Force Base, they had this uh, thing. When was this? This was 2012. No, yeah. That's where the uh, X-37 is, right? Edwards? Um, they, I'm sure, did some test landings there before because now it, it lands at the you know, regular installations like in Florida and California. So this was honoring the X-15 test pilots who actually became astronauts because they went up above the 66 miles, I believe it is. Uh, threshold into space, but they never earned their astronaut wings. So all the X-15 pilots went to Edwards for this thing. And uh, so him and a number of others, uh, th this is, this is uh, kind of a cool picture. I know I have it here somewhere. Um, yeah, <laughs> kind of a little raggedy. But anyway, this is uh, Neil Armstrong and Joe Engel. Uh, interesting, and this kind of ties in with the whole thing. I have a nice color picture, so if anyone wants to uh, let me know, I'll send it to you. Um, this first man on the moon, as you all know, Joe Engel was also an X-15 test pilot. So this like, tells the whole human experience. 
Joe Engel was supposed to be on the last mission to the moon. And, but he, unfortunately, when they cut Apollo 18, 19, 20, he got bumped because they want to put a geologist on the last mission, Harrison Schmidt. So Joe got bumped from that. So just imagine, here's two guys, equal test pilots. First man on the moon, he was going to be on the last mission to the moon. Um, so anyway, he got bumped from that. So just picture having that whole thing pulled out from under you. But here's like a strong person. Yeah, you know, this is like that thing about, you know, life's twists and turns. So, but he ended up being the commander of the second space shuttle mission. And then I flew one or two more missions after that. And a very terrific person. So this is like an interesting thing. But anyway, uh, that was at Edwards. And uh, there were a number of the X-15 test pilots that have, have now since died, including Neil Armstrong, not here anymore, physically, but in spirit and in our history books. So uh, I forget how I got on that tangent. But anyway, so yeah, I was back in high school, very interested in all these things. It's like, how am I going to get to this? How am I going to get to work with this stuff that I really love? And this whole underlying talk is about passion and making things happen in your life. Like I was explaining to you, it's like it's not so much the stuff because you could like, this could be a violin instead. And if you're like, or a piece of art or something. And if you just have it in you that you want to be an artist or you want to be a musician or whatever you want to be, find that spark of, of what you're interested in. And then magic, if you just focus on it, like this was like laser focus in my life. If you focus on that, you will meet the people that will make magic difference in your life. Things will happen. Things will unfold because you're on a mission. It's a mission. It's really, it's a mission. It's a a mission of life, and I really believe we're all here for a purpose, and to find that purpose is so important. And all these uh, missions are super ambitious, including uh, one of the projects that you've been telling me about, which is the Las Vegas spaceport. Yeah, we're, uh, and you fast forward years later, I've had my whole career that I'll get into. I successfully navigated that whole thing, and so I moved to Las Vegas in 2009, and it's like, I, I came from the Central Coast, Santa Barbara area, Vandenberg Air Force Base, if anyone knows where that is. So 30 years there working for the military uh, programs. Uh, for I went there for space shuttle, actually. That was like my first thing, and that's a whole story. But anyway, so all these years later, that's all done. You know, like Space shuttle has been gone now for how many years? So, And I moved to Las Vegas, got divorced, moved to Las Vegas like all good men should do. <laughs> Never planned this. I can't believe I live here. Anyway, it's like, how did I end up here? But it's a wonderful city. So anyway, uh, the infrastructure, all this stuff, but won't go on a tangent. So it's like I'm here, and it's like, well, you know, I'm really into this stuff, but there really wasn't anyone here that I could relate to over it. And then Nevada got chosen as a, one of the six states designated to be a UAV, a manned aerial vehicle test site which means we're going to test drones here and build up the industry. So only six, six states were chosen. And at that point, uh, the people in the industry started coming out of the woodwork. This fantastic guy, my friend Steve, he was the guy who like, led the proposal that won it for the state. And then he'd have these UAV forums over at uh, Atomic Testing Museum, DRI, uh, Desert Research Institute. And he gave me a forum to like talk about space and this organization I was with for aerospace. And then this guy came up to me afterwards. He goes, oh, I like what you're saying about cruise missile. I worked that program too. My great friend Bob, who lives here. And turns out I was in Washington, D.C. working it. He was in Hawaii working it. We knew the same people. And then since then, there's been other people. We know the same people back then with the Navy that I was working magic again and now there's probably about 10 i have a core of like 10 solid military mostly background people that i'm working with to make the spaceport thing happen we call ourselves the nevada aerospace coalition and uh, we're united people and companies to our intention is to make this happen again this is a, a journey but it's all these years later but had nevada not won the uav competition with all 50 states and been one of the six chosen, this little group wouldn't have formed. And I'd still be getting my 
aerospace connection with my company back in California, of which I go back for about a week each month to, to work with them and you know, just keep up on everything. I work from home here, but I formed a Nevada home with aerospace. Well, I view Nevada as a place that's starting to really hustle and bustle in the aerospace world with not just Nellis here, but we also have all sorts of really cool space events here. My friend, uh, Steven Steiner, he was a groomsman at my wedding, and we went to uh, NASA Academy and we did NASA projects together for, for a few years at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and he, he uh, now is a flight director for the Zero Gravity Corporation, doing uh, KC-135 Omicomet Comet flights. Uh, now that's a fun thing now, but we used to do it as experiments, creating aerogel in zero G. So when you were at Goddard, I think you were, you were mentioned. I was at Goddard. I was Goddard Space Flight Center. Doing, and yeah. I was doing, uh, I was doing um, one project before I did the project with Steve. That was, it was a, a device that was supposed to help astronauts on the International Space Station and also a spacecraft to send to the moon. Wow, wow. <laughs> and that was amazing. Like when we first talked, did you mention this stuff? It's like, wow, this was interesting. Like when we first met. It's like, I just had this thing. It's like, well, I didn't know you lived in Las Vegas. Okay. So when I heard you lived in Las Vegas, like, I had no idea. I just said, hey, I live in Las Vegas. I'm doing these things. And then you told me about your Air Force experience mm -hmm. and the NASA Goddard experience. It's like, wow, you know, that was magic. And here we are today. <laughs> this is a great place to uh, have really innovative products like this because there's so much land and it's a booming industry. It's also close to the West Coast but also there's so much available resources and everyone flies here. So it's kind of a cool tourist destination for people who want to do space Amazing. tourist sites or recreate maybe a, a Mars experience that's nowhere nearby or something like that. Yeah. And that's something a friend of mine is working on that project I can tell you about, probably not on camera because he's, it's kind of. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, did a simulated um, Mars experience uh -huh. uh, between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, where they went out into the, the dunes and they, lived out there as if they were on Mars. <laughs> well, well, I didn't know about that. Yeah, and it's kind of, as most of us that live here, we've driven that I-15 and out in the middle of nowhere for a while and all yeah. those side roads. It's like, it is another world out there. <laughs> so, um, When I was out um, at Goddard, I also had some opportunities to go down to the headquarters and also go down to Congress. So it was kind of cool. I got to, um, got to meet Buzz Aldrin and Dennis Tito right after they did, uh, Dennis Tito did the uh, space tourism event. Right. Uh, meet some of the congressmen that were involved with uh, promoting space. And it's really cool to see how the aerospace community, especially people focusing on getting things into space, is so tightly wound, tightly uh, integrated. Um, I guess um, I'm curious about how, how you view the community since you've been in it in your entire career. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> their stories. But anyway, there's fair and open competition, and sometimes there's no way you're busting into the good old boy network. But anyway, this is America. <laughs> so, um, but eh, not to go down that too much, but <laughs> I remember, you know, the whole Dennis Tito thing. Um, Buzz Aldrin, he came out to be a speaker at our Endeavor Center at the time. And uh, actually, my business partner and I and him were all in the car. And the whole time he hardly talked to us because he was on his phone working the Dennis Tito thing. He was like, as much as I can tell, he was like pushing to make that happen. He saw the vision of that and he was very, 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 he did an excellent program with us, but like every available moment where he could, he was either on the phone or emails, text, whatever. I forget what technology this was <laughs> like. Um, around 2000. I don't know if we had texting yet. But anyway, he was on his phone. He had a phone and he, he was doing stuff. And I, I really believe if it wasn't for him and pushing that agenda, it wouldn't have happened. I could be wrong, but that was my impression from, from that. And he was very, I don't know if we ever said, oh, what are you tied up with? But, but anyway, it was like really apparent that's what he was doing. And I remember, again, I'm thinking now, he was on the phone, he's making calls. I heard the name Dennis a few times. So he's really advocating that. So yeah, it's... Everything comes down to relationships. Everything comes down to it's who you know, but also what capabilities you bring to the table. And I really view the world 
win-win. It's like, you know, how can, and, and all this, and whatever it is, whatever field of interest someone's in, how do you create win-win relationships with other people where everybody goes up? Now you've been doing a lot of lectures recently for some really important institutions throughout Nevada about uh, various projects that you're working on. I'd be curious about some of those projects that you're talking about and those passions that are most important to you that you wanted to share. Yeah, well, in Nevada, this whole thing to get the spaceport. Um, I have a whole presentation. <laughs> it lasts about an hour. You get another one of those things I could, I could talk about for a long time. But in essence, Nevada has an opportunity. OK, so there's this vehicle built by a company in Nevada. I mentioned their name, Sierra Nevada Corporation, terrific visionary company. And they're building this vehicle, a small, maybe if I just reach over here for a second, I'll grab this picture. Uh, so this is their Dream Chaser vehicle. It's all on website. You just type in Dream Chaser. Uh, here's like a little, I don't know, this, it's a very good uh, artist rendition. It looks like it's real, but it's probably photoshopped in. But there it is like in comparison next to the Space Shuttle Orbiter. And uh, this vehicle, it can actually carry seven astronauts, which was the maximum amount the Space Shuttle carried. Uh, cargo, it's about, I think, a fifth less. I have all the specs on here. But anyway, their whole goal here again, vision, win-win. They want to be able to land this at any commercial airport that has over 10,000 foot runway. So it's like, I heard about that. And it's like, well, let me research that. And turns out Las Vegas has a few runways that meet that, two at uh, McCarran and two at Nellis. So thus began the... Uh, <laughs> the path that we talked about before. And this core of people from the UAV community, a man aerial vehicles, who made it happen here, it's like, these are my buds now. It's like, we started talking and they all got on board with this concept. And there's been some just amazing connections here in Nevada line. I never could have got into the director of the airport or you know the uh, um, Office of Economic Development for the governor, whatever, but excellent connections here that have the vision that made it happen. UAVs made it happen with these meetings. So we're leveraging this or pushing it. Bottom line of this whole thing is May 7th, 2020 is the 100 year anniversary of the first airplane landing in Las Vegas. So think about all the airplanes that land here. How many, uh, how many visit 42 million a year people like come here? Probably 38 of million of them flying in, one airplane after another. I live on the approach path, so I know, and I love it. I, I'm the only person who bought a house in the approach path so I could watch the airplanes, because I love this stuff. But anyway, so on that day, May 7, 2020, which is like two years and something, uh, two years, eight months, or whatever, uh, you have a calculator, you can do it. Um, it's going to be the 100 year anniversary of Randall Henderson, landing the first airplane in Las Vegas, of which Henderson, Nevada is named after. So that's a very interesting thing. I, what we're pushing for, what I would like to see, I think would be the most fitting thing for the 100 year anniversary of the first airplane landing here is to dedicate the spaceport, Las Vegas or Southern Nevada spaceport at that time. And what's involved, we're basically, we need to raise only a million dollars. And it's like, wow, it's a lot but not really because that's for the environmental impact study and for the safety assessment. Once we have that designation, Las Vegas is instantly, it can be called a spaceport. What that does immediately, every flight from around the world coming to Las Vegas, yet you've been on many flights here, you know, there's like a special spirit on board those airplanes. Like people are looking forward to coming here. A lot of times when we land, People clap. It's like, wow, we're here. You know, they've been picturing coming here for six months or so. <laughs> it's like their vacation. Just picture if you add in the added level of excitement of we're landing in a spaceport now. Now when we come to Las Vegas, we're coming to the Las Vegas spaceport. It'd be that official designation. Look at all that they've done with what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas with that phrase. It's like, think of what we can do with a spaceport designation. Million dollars gets you that. But anyway, then as this vehicle matures, we would be able to land it here. And the main thing is, it's not so much, okay, you land the vehicle here, it's what industries do you build up in the area around it. It's like the old days. 
with the locomotive in the 1800s. It's like you had the Baldwin Locomotive Works and some others. They built these engines who, that pulled cars and trains and freight and people. And then you found out, oh, it's going to be coming through our territory. It's like, what if we built a town around that? What if we have restaurants? What if we have hotels? It's all what you do with it. It's not the train. It's what you do with it. So the train is the opportunity. If the railroad's coming through your little town of 50 people, can you turn into a town of 5,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people in the future through the industry that you build around that? And that's what we're looking to do here. A prime, now I'll kind of jump ahead a little bit, uh, a prime industry which is amazing is the small satellite industry. I'm going to just grab one of these. And uh, you probably have that in the shot. This is just a mock-up that I made, but there are real versions of these things. Um, there's this whole industry with small satellites. Basically, you know, you take your phone. I have my phone right here. What is in here? Can you picture 20 years ago? It would take a processing system the size of this room, and even still, it wouldn't exist. It's like the technology has shrunk that much. The same thing has happened with satellites. Satellites, you need these large boosters in general to launch large payloads that take 15, 20 years to develop, cost billions of dollars in general. By the time they're in orbit, they're outdated because the technology is 15, 20 years old. Then there are huge sitting ducks up there for being knocked out of commission with an anti-satellite kinetic kill. You, like the Chinese did that, like I forget how many years ago now. But they basically, they, they killed one of their weather satellites and instantly they created all the space debris about equal to the amount of debris that was already up there, all these little pieces. So anyway, your large satellites are very vulnerable in orbit. Didn't mean to get off on that tangent. But anyway, very vulnerable. With these small guys, you can launch, like you can even launch these off the wing of an airplane with a small booster. Instantly, you get into orbit when you need it. The technology is fresh. You can have like a, and this, our company works with this, a uh, military version of this that's as robust as a military satellite, but just small size. And the electronics and the systems that you put in these things are all kind of like your phone, probably even more advanced. And the technology is fresh. You put it up into orbit. And picture you have like lots of these little guys up there. Then you network them in space. It's like a computer network in space. They're all talking to each other. And then it's like, OK, well, this technology has been flying for about a year. And there's some new technology that we would like to launch instead. So you basically you deorbit this one, because we're responsible stewards of space now with space debris. And there's companies that build uh, deorbiting systems, whether it's a little gas jet or a tether it puts out to create drag in the atmosphere. This thing comes back. You launch your newer satellite. And again, the technology in this thing is equal to something, quote, the size of this room. So you're getting huge capability, lots of them in space doing different functions, very survivable. You're not going to blind these things, even if we, there's laser-based systems to knock out satellites. Good luck finding these little guys. And you could even have decoys up there, so you wouldn't even, the enemy wouldn't even know which one to knock out. So very survivable kind of thing. Anyway, bottom line is there's no real home for these yet. These are, there's a wonderful conference up at uh, Utah State University every year, a small satellite conference. If you recall, during sequestration and all this stuff, when conference attendance is going down, 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 theirs was going up, up, up still. They're huge. It's unbelievable, a couple thousand people from around the world. So part of the vision is, OK, Dream Chaser, it could launch lots of these things. This could be an industry, a, an industry of very precise technological advantages that we could do in Las Vegas. So that's part of the mission that I present with this. Like This is an example of an industry, an industry of the future, which we could call home in Las Vegas area, southern Nevada, whatever. Um, presently, the large satellites, generally, their home is at, around the L.A. airport area, El Segundo. Uh, the large satellites are built there. But, and we're still going to need large satellites because there's still large things. Like if you have a large mirror you have to launch for a telescope or whatever, it's like you're not going to fold that thing down into a tiny thing. You're still going to need a large 
payload and a large rocket to launch it. So still there's going to be a place for it. But kind of a guess is maybe 60, 70% of the satellites can be shrunk down into lots of little ones. And there's a lot of brilliant minds working this and thinking about this now. And uh, so that's, that's like the future, but that's, that's coming. And that's uh, one of the things I see, well, let's see what we can do in this area with that. I see that being very important. I remember I was at UC San Diego and students had launched their own satellites. And it seems like being able to launch a satellite, you can do so many different things. And having so many of them out there, you'll kind of need that to remove the clutter. Especially when you have a situation where we're going to have um, reusable launch vehicles for people for people to travel around the world. I'd love to have the um, actualization of the entrepreneurs that are trying to create a situation where you could travel to anywhere in the world using yeah. suborbital space. I know that uh, Virgin Galactic's been working on that for a very long time. Right. And I have, uh, that's one of the pages from my presentation, <laughs> out of the giving. This is another, so, okay, so I mentioned in, in Las Vegas about how just having the title spaceport is good immediately for tourism. But also, we know, you've driven like by the Las Vegas sign, you see all those nice jets out there. There's people with money that come here that like to come here. Those jets someday will be these kind of vehicles that can travel at many times Mach number speed and get here from just about anywhere in the world from 45 minutes to an hour. Of course that's going to happen someday. Hypersonic vehicles are very much uh, with a company we work with, hypersonic with, with tracking, we're getting into that. So it's, it's a growing industry. Hypersonics are very important and that technology is going to be in these vehicles that'll kind of futuristic like on the cover of Popular Mechanics, but I about guarantee, 100%, but I would guess within 20, 30 years, we're gonna start seeing at least Mach 2 business jets and then hypersonics coming in. With the spaceport designation, because anything over Mach 1, speed of sound, get sonic boom, you have the environmental impact. That's what our study for a million dollars, that, that looks at all the environmental impacts of vehicles traveling at a high speed coming into land. So these vehicles of the future, it opens up the door for all you guys, wherever around the world that want to come here in your uh, little nice uh, business spaceships, not jets, um, you'll be able to land here. And we want to bring those people in because they bring lots of money to Las Vegas. So that's, that's a big thing. So exactly what you're saying. That's, that's like a big vision of this thing. We're really working in the future. But the whole spaceport concept opens it up a little bit at a time right away. Any flight from anywhere in the world, the captain can say, we're going to the Las Vegas spaceport. And whatever enthusiasm that brings, what kind of tourism, extra little shine it brings, that's a bonus. And for only a million dollars, that's not bad for all that outreach and then opening up the door to all this. So anyway, if there's anyone who wants to <laughs> donate to this. But um, anyway, that's, that's the future. Uh, that uh, the big picture of Las Vegas uh, that that I kind of see so Definitely. but anyway so yeah I kind of jumped at but um, do we want to you know I can take yeah. you through kind of the journey I love I love to, to figure out what, what everything is over here so yeah I'll just kind of and again I'm just trying to tie into principles because the main thing here is just like when you see me on here it's like yeah this guy's in the space stuff but picture for your own use, what are you passionate about? What kind of connections did you have in your life through relatives, friends, things that caught your attention? What is it? What's your life's mission? Defining your life's mission. That's the important message. So I kind of forget about this stuff. This was my life mission. You don't have to be interested in this mission. It's the underlying concept. What have you hooked your thought? What star have you hooked your thoughts onto? Where do you want to go? I love what you said earlier when you were saying that you basically locked yourself into your passion and went full steam ahead. Kind of like what was the actual, you would say, hands-on version of what people describe as the law of attraction or described as a secret, where you just put everything you could into it from when you were a kid all the way forward. And then you actualize yourself to jump into a position where today you're involved with that childhood dream, the stars you saw from the astronauts from the Apollo 
to actually watching them on TV as a kid to actually meeting the same astronauts yeah. or at least some of them and then being a leader now in space. And so yeah, the actualization of it is cool. And then to see you describe the stories, you can see the passion, see the focus and everything that you put into it. Yeah. Uh, as not just a, a journey from a kid, but your entire life. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, I just always, I looked at school as a formality, <laughs> something I had to do to get to this point in my life. And as I mentioned, it's like, I feel like I'm just beginning now. There's so much to do. The world is opened up. The opportunities with, to be golden age of space entrepreneurship <laughs> is what I call it. But anyway, I'll take you back to like where this inspiration came from. And again, it's my journey. The point of this is what, you the viewer, what similar things came into your life that inspired you at a young age? And if you're looking to like find your life mission, how you can find that in your life. So in my family, I was really fortunate. Like um, my father was born in 1929 and his older brother was born like in 1917 or something. I think he'd be coming up on his 100th birthday now, but he's not around anymore. But anyway, this is, this is where it began. So my family uh, was from the New England area, Boston area. And their parents, my, my father's parents, they came over from, you know, on the boat and set up shop. And they had a candy store outside of Boston. And so my uncle was born like 17, when he was like 10 years old, like 1927, whatever. That was roughly like about... 23, 24 years after the Wright brothers first flew. So I have my little Wright brothers model here to talk about that. And, you know, you can go into any store now and buy a model of something and build it. And it's like, you know, you look at all these models. You could get a model of just about anything. So, but they didn't have that back then. So my uncle, and this, I love this story. And I have it on videotape. I actually taped them talking about this like 15, 20 years ago. He was so enthused with flight, and that was the age of barnstorming, all that stuff. What did he have that he could kind of grab onto that and express in his life? All he had were resources in the candy store. And they had like a deli and ice cream and all that stuff. So he took popsicle sticks, and he built like a recreation of the airplanes and the Wright Flyer and those kind of things at that time. So he built these models out of popsicle sticks. That was his way, like if he could see all this stuff now. <laughs> you know, it's like that was all he could do, but he had the interest and passion. And then what happened, so here's my father, who was the youngest in the family. There were four kids all together. My father got inspiration in aviation from him and ended up going in the Air Force, of which I was born on an Air Force base and been kind of in that realm my whole life. So... And then my father actually worked on the Apollo program with the fuel cells. So he'd like bring home stuff from work and this and that, whatever. So I already had the interest just because being born into the space age at the perfect time. I actually saw President Kennedy drive by my school like in 19, uh, it was before he became president first time. He came by in a motor, he was in first grade, whenever that was. So it's like I, I still have this picture in my mind seeing the, you know, the originator of yeah, because he was the architect of this, that saying we should go to the moon. So anyway, so that all pushed into that. And then my father and whatever, it's like I was just on this road of passion. Like I mentioned, like I was like seven years old, I, I would set my alarm to wake up for when the first probes were reaching the moon from the United States. So I was really into this stuff. But that was the, the point is, that was the original thing. This was what became my passion back then. You all and your families, you might have some, someone who's in some symphony at the turn of the century, <laughs> whatever, or an artist in your family. And it's like, if you got that inspiration, you haven't like tapped into it and realized, wow, look at the resources I have from my family and friends and interests or whatever. It's like, that's, that's again, that's the little thread that you find and you just start following that. And that's all that I did here. So anyway, so I got through school, wasn't the best student. But what got me through was my passion. It was the passion for all this stuff and someday wanting to work on this. There was like no way I wasn't going to graduate on time, even though I barely did. But again, the magic of that pulled me through. 
And I was very fortunate to be hired by the Navy when I first graduated in 1977, 40 years ago now, can't believe it. Uh, and I was hired into <laughs> well, kind of a story. Um, I wanted to come out to California. You know, you grew up in New England. It's like California is still the big dream. It's like I had never been west of the Mississippi River. So a lot of people that grew up out here, you take it for granted. But back like in the 70s, this was, this was the magic place in the 60s and 70s. And this whole thing, and then aerospace, Apollo, uh, many of the components were built out here. Space shuttle was built in Downey, California. It's like this was the place. So I was just determined to come out here upon graduation in 1977 and get a job with the space shuttle, which had just been starting at that time. And um, so what happened within a couple of days of this big commitment, July 1st, 1977, I bought the ticket and coming out. Like a couple of days before that, the B-1 bomber program was canceled. President Jimmy Carter canceled the B-1 bomber program. So yeah, they're still doing space stuff, but basically canceling that program, Rockwell in California, took a big hit from that. It's like, I could have been a student and they weren't gonna hire me. <laughs> Never mind the, uh, you know, just graduated student. So I came out here, no job, nothing. You know, I, even, I went to San Francisco for a couple weeks. It's like, I really didn't want to be up there because the space program really wasn't up there at the time, some Silicon Valley stuff. I don't even know if it was called that then. But anyway, I was very fortunate. Here again, a magic thing. My roommate from college, awesome guy, Charlie. Still keep in touch. He had got a job. He had been working for the Navy with co-op jobs. He said, well, there's plenty of jobs here in Washington, D.C. So I go to Washington, D.C. It's like, you know, I, I spent my month in California. Nothing worked out. It's like, you know, I got to start working. So I interviewed with the Navy. I went to like seven offices. Six of them said yes. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and then, so I had to choose. And that was amazing. So, so this one office, the guy had models on his desk, like he had this. <laughs> and he had some other models on his desk. And you know me, it's like I said to myself, if the guy has models on his desk, he can't be all that bad. <laughs> and that was the office I picked. And again, that magic kind of thing, I couldn't have asked for a better job, but the, here's the thing. That office was the cruise missile office. The reason they canceled the B-1 bomber, which prevented me from getting the job in California, I took that job, and I didn't even know it. When I, I just said, oh, the guy's got models on his desk. This is, you know, <laughs> gotta be a good guy. And then it's like, wow. And then, so this is the harpoon. And uh, this is still in use today. And uh, then the Tomahawk, which we've seen a lot of lately in these wars. So I got to be the interface to that cruise missile, Tomahawk cruise missile office. I met so many great people, of which, jumping ahead to here in Nevada, that guy I mentioned who was in Hawaii at the time, I was in DC, we knew the same people. It ties back into that. There's someone else here that, that I've met. Um, know the same people from back in those days, those magic years from 1977 to 1982. Wonderful time. Navy was terrific, but I want to work with space stuff. So here's what happened here, another magic moment in following your passion. This was awesome, terrific people. If I'd stayed with the Navy, I would have done very well there. I gave it all up because one day I heard that the space shuttle was coming to California. They wanted to launch it from Vandenberg Air Force Base. So I was there, wow. And uh, the way I found out about this, here's, uh, this was actually the president of McDonnell Douglas at the time, John Yardley. And we all know about mentors and all that. Through this organization I belonged to, I got to meet him, see him speak, and also at that dinner, was my boss of the cruise missile office, not my immediate boss, the guy who was head of the Tomahawk. And I said, this is a transition point. And I talked to him, I wrote him a letter. I brought all this stuff with me. Anyway, the guy writes me back. President McDonald August, February 11th, 1982. And he says, thanks for your note. It'd be fine for you to stop by my office during a visit, but due to my schedule, I suggest you call first, yeah. And uh, then he says, the career goals you, 
Your sets seem realistic, well thought out, and logical. Best of luck to you. And this is the magic part. And I still buy, live by this today. It says, best of luck to you in reaching for, or better yet, surpassing all those goals. He was looking beyond my interest in the space shuttle. It's like beyond, looking beyond. There is so much wisdom just in that one sentence. And that's been the a major defining thing of my career of which all these other things I've got into. And uh, so he's since uh, left the Earth. But uh, this is a picture of him next to that harpoon missile here. And their little saying here is when you build 100,000 of anything, you get pretty good at it. So I thought that was really cool. And it's true. And McDonnell Douglas is a huge company, and now they are bought by Boeing. This is in St. Louis. And some of the viewers here might live in that area and remember the old McDonnell Douglas plant. They also built the Gemini spacecraft and a whole history, uh, F-4, F-15, so forth and so on. So I think we've kind of got through all this stuff. OK, so all this stuff goes on. But 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger launches with a teacher in space on board. And I was working shuttle program. I, I got hired into shuttle at Vandenberg, by the way. There were three civilian jobs. The rest is military. Didn't get the first. Keep in mind, I threw away my whole career in Washington, D.C. for this opportunity. Didn't get the second. I got the third one. And wow, I couldn't believe it. I, like, I remember I went to the bathroom and cried for 10 minutes. <laughs> Men aren't supposed to cry, but I, <laughs> I cried with happiness. Um, it's like, wow, and you can picture the whole focus of my life to that point with that. So I was just so happy, and I just wanted to do a great job with this. And so that was in February, 80, February of 83, I got hired, and in January of 86, the Challenger blew up. I had a number of trips to, to Florida, I had training with the space shuttle, I uh, got to be inside the Discovery the first time it was powered up on the launch pad. I still can hear the fans in my mind. You know, I, I, I hear the sounds, I smell everything. All these years later, it's funny how those things stick with you. Wonderful thing. Challenger blew up. It's like, wow. So just picture the whole thrust of my life, everything I had been in my mind was like, wow. No more manned space program. You know, that was huge because Vandenberg basically shut down the shuttle. We weren't going to launch it from there anymore. So I said, well, what am I going to do? You know, I like living in California. I always want to do that. But it's like my, my big mission was now gone. No more space shuttle. So, but I stuck with it. And <laughs> this was so funny. What office do I end up in? One of my coworkers ended up becoming head of the safety office there at Vandenberg. And I got to work the Titan IV program, which replaced, kind of looks like that. Um, replaced the space shuttle with the payloads. Um, military had said, okay, we're putting all our eggs in one basket. Everything's going to launch on the space shuttle. So they stopped defining the payload shape to fit in these rockets anymore. They're all going to fit in the cargo bay of the space shuttle, which was 15 feet across by 60 feet long. And uh, so they had this whole lot of payloads that wouldn't fit in these anymore. And they all had to be redesigned to fit in these guys. And I got to work the whole safety program for the ground buildup. You have the launch pad, everything. So it's like it wasn't a manned program, but I was into what replaced the space shuttle You know, from that aspect. Space shuttle flew again like two, three years later, so forth and so on. My way of staying connected with it, by the way, was to work with the students to fly their experiments in the space shuttle. I had to mention that. That's how we started the Endeavour Center. And that flew in 1993 on the space shuttle Endeavour. STS-57 was the mission. But anyway, so back to this. Um, so it was a whole career redefinition. And I, uh, I just realized I forgot to bring a prop, so I'll, I'll describe it instead. Um, I wanted to become, learn more about entrepreneurship at the time. It's like my big dream was gone, what can I do? Uh, so on a trip I took in 1988, and not many people save their envelope, but this is another example. <laughs> I was flying from Santa Barbara to Denver, and then Denver to Atlanta. 
and you can see the two flights here. But anyway, I was on flight 438 to Denver. And I had original seat of uh, 19A, it looks like. And I asked, it's like, can I get a seat up front, you know, further up? And you can see where they scratched it out and they wrote 3A. Just about ready for the door of the airplane to close. No one was next to me. This woman gets on like right at the end, sits down in the C, uh, the 3C, and we start talking. And it was kind of this person like kind of knew a lot about my life. It was very interesting, a lot of interests and things like that. And she was going to Denver for a trade show, and she was an entrepreneur. And to really condense a whole lot of stuff, this was the key that inspired me to open that door to entrepreneurship because of this seat change right here. If I had sat in the, well, maybe I would have sat next to someone else in the back. I don't know. But this is, this is what defined my life. And I jumped in uh, full speed. There was no YouTube then. Um, there was this guy, a marketing guy, uh, E. Joseph Kosman, And he was like the marketing guru. So I sent away for his cassettes and his workbooks, and I devoured everything. And I basically invented something. And I had to learn how to write a patent on it. So it's like, so there's a picture like a year, year and a half of deep study for all this stuff. Like, how do I even get involved? And I wrote this patent, and the patent got issued. It was basically first, and I was going to bring it, but I forgot. A small aquarium that either sits on a table or hangs on the wall. Forever there have been aquariums that sit on tables or hang on the wall. There would never been one that did both without any modification. So they granted me a patent on that. And that opened up the door. I ended up working with a manufacturer. We manufactured, made like 30,000, 40,000. I remember I was in Florida once. I was in Colorado once. And I actually bought one in the pet stores. Now you can get aquariums on your phone. So they <laughs> don't need the. It was for the uh, Siamese fighting fish, the beta fish which wants a small space and it just breathes air. It takes a little gulp of air. So it was the perfect beta tank. So um, anyway, so that opened up the door. Then I came up with another product. Then I actually, uh, the person I worked with asked me to write this book on being an air courier, which I did. And so this got me all spun up. And then in combination with my friend uh, who became the leader of our company and uh, I co-founded with him, we started getting, we flew a student experiments on, in space, and then we co-founded our company, and it enabled me to jump in with our patents. And now, like, I write patents pretty regularly of really, you know, heavy duty, not, not consumer items, but, like, intricate detail of, of all these systems for space, GPS tracking systems for missiles and rockets, power systems. This is, like, a little example. We, we kind of take, like, the battery that's in your phone, and, like, we make it a whole lot more powerful. This could light a 100 watt light bulb for like, I think an hour or something like that. You know, very energy dense. And we're the first to qualify these for operating in space. So those are like our two product lines and then the satellites. But anyway, this is what started that whole journey. It was, it was this little thing in 1980, October 21st, 1988, when, when this happened. And which then turned into our company. I retired from government with 33 years. I, I worked for the Navy for five years and 28 years, whatever it is, with the Air Force and learned all this space stuff. You know, I stuck with it after the Challenger blew up. And uh, so now I'm in full entrepreneur, space entrepreneur mode at the perfect time when all this is going on and, and just very involved with the day-to-day -day kind of things, the small satellites, um, whatever is coming. Like I mentioned, it's the golden age of space entrepreneurship. All these things, the different companies you've heard about, you know, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, all these things. There's many pioneers now. Jeff Bezos, don't want to leave anyone out. Or I won't get my packages delivered. But uh, anyway, just kidding. Um, this is the time, and we're so fortunate and very involved in the industry. And again, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm 10 years old again with this, except I've kind of gone through all the stuff to get to this point. Now it's like the, the fun times, and you know, I look forward to the next 100 years <laughs> to see how long I live. So, um, but the main thing is, is the outreach, the relationships you form, 
bottom line of all this, again, don't get too stuck on the stuff. It's like, what passions do you have? What are you interested in? There's a lot of people looking for their mission in life, you know, like yourself, me, other people we know. It's like we're for, you know, we live in kind of a small world where, you know, we're focused and we're on a mission. You probably feel the same way. It's like, wow, I'm not even at the beginning yet. You know, you've done so much, but there's so much to do. And that's the way with this. But I wish everyone in the world has had that connection into their life and opportunity. So I have another thing, just kind of pulling all this together. Um, you know, there's like the, the physical. There's also the, you know, I, I want to keep this machine going as well as I can. I eat well. I get good rest, all these things. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, meditation is important, something. Kind of one of the um, concepts was the concept of quantum leaps in your life. I think that's the, the underlying thing. How do you make a quantum leap in your life? And I think it's because of realizations about things and what can you do next. And then, you know, the magic things happen. So uh, meditation is important. Another thing, um, there, there's two words. You probably heard them out there. It's like meditation and contemplation. You probably heard that term too. Meditation is kind of like when you quiet your mind. I do this every day. Uh, you quiet your mind, but I do contemplation actually where you actively visualize things. That's like an important thing. Like you're, you're in the process. You kind of like postulate something. You picture something, and you then see if you get any feedback from that. And you probably heard, you know, like OM, A-U-M. You know, there's different things that, that people use and all that stuff. There's this word hue, H-U. I don't know if you've heard that one. But that, I found, is a very powerful word. Like, I've done all the stuff, <laughs> and that's, like, what I focus on now. But again, that's helped me connect with finding what I'm about that has brought the magic things into my life. And that thing is just very simple. So if you're doing whatever you want to call it, meditation, contemplation, but if you're actively doing that, then it's contemplation. If you're visualizing things, I like to visualize those two letters, H and U, and work with that and see what comes to me. And it's very interesting what, what happens with that. So that's kind of, you know, I, I almost forgot to mention that. But underlying all that, I always knew as part of the process that I would find what I connect with also in a, quote, spiritual sense or whatever you want to call it. You know, because how do you have a life's purpose if you don't have some kind of seeing yourself in the bigger picture of life kind of thing? And that really helped me find that bigger picture of life. So um, that's kind of it. And the rest of the stuff is stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is a picture. This is my first, uh, I don't know if you zoom in this later. This was my first thing before I uh, had that famous airplane flight. I just figured, well, what can I do? Uh, I think this is before the Challenger blew up. Um, I set up this thing. I got these jackets from uh, NASA, the NASA store. And if you remember, you know, that, the astronauts, the way they, like, dress up with their flight jacket and they have a picture by the flag and all that stuff. I figured, well, let me go to, like, a flea market and do that. So I, like, got, a, like, a screen and put a flag on it. And uh, then, uh, you know, had the opportunity, like, for five hours for people to have their picture taken like they were an astronaut. Well, turns out I was a whole lot more interested in this than the general public was. <laughs> However, you know, I, I think someone wanted to buy the jacket. <laughs> so, Where can I get that jacket? I maybe had one or two people. But, but again, this is one of those things. It's like, well, you know, I'm testing the waters of entrepreneurship. It's before I learned all the things I had to learn with that course that I took at home and then learned how to write patents and all that stuff. So this is like, this is kind of one of my favorites, it's the beginning of the journey right here. And then everything that followed from that. And uh, I'm probably forgetting. Oh, I love this phrase. It says, Whenever, oh, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind, not with it. And Henry Ford said that. So as we go through life, and life is a journey, you want to bring in all the resources that you can from whatever drives you spiritual, interest, whatever, all this stuff, the wind's going to be against you. A lot of times I'm involved in a lot of things where the wind is against me, of course. But that's how the airplane gets off the ground. 
you know, if, the, if you have uh, 20 knots of wind blowing straight on the airplane, the airplane gets off the ground by going 20, I'll say miles an hour, less, because that forward wind is giving it extra lift. Say if you could tie the airplane to a stake and you had 160 mile an hour wind, the airplane would just lift up. So that's what we mean here. It's like you want the wind in your face, going against you, because that's how you take off and pursue your life and your dreams. You know, you have ideas, but as soon as you go on the road, stuff's gonna happen, but you have to, that's the, the adventure of life. It's, you know, we go forward, we do everything to follow our passions and dreams. So this was just a little snapshot of mine, and uh, if any of you, I don't know, wanna contact me, um, just look me up on LinkedIn, I guess would be the simplest thing, and you know, send me a uh, connection request, and I'd be happy. I'm here just to help people, their life. I'm, I'm very career focused, I'm very happy in my career, and what I'm doing, any way I can help and mentor others the way people have helped and mentor me, I am very happy to do that. And it's, it's a wonderful thing we have these tools like LinkedIn and all this social media and all that stuff. But for this, probably, this is more tailored towards a LinkedIn thing than a uh, Instagram, I guess I would say. It's like, this is business, but it's finding your career and your path in life. So I'm happy to help. Uh, just, you know, look me up. Marty, M-A-R-T-Y, W-A-L-D-M-A-N. So... Uh, Thank you. Unless you do you have other awesome. questions, I, I just kept no, talking. Thanks, 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 Marty. I think that's a great opportunity that everyone could take advantage of. And uh, I loved uh, your focus on not just how the space, which is in and of itself an awesome opportunity, but uh, your mindsets, you know, focusing around those core concepts, like how the Air Force says, aim high. You have the, a great yeah. quote. I think that quote is awesome from, from Ford. Uh, yeah. But thanks so much for doing this interview, man. This has been a great time. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And we're all about we, the rising tide lifts all boats. You know, it's like win, win, whatever we can do for the world. That's that's, that's my mission and uh, and yours. So uh, it's fantastic. Awesome. Great Cheers. You. Thank you.